I knew that if I were going to write something different, I needed to be somewhere different or do something different. So I thought, I just want to go somewhere and be alone and think a little bit about how I'm feeling. My heart was racing every day, because every day I had to get a song finished, and I was running out of time. The story for the movie actually goes all the way back to September of 2015. We were headed to Japan and I had to change my phone. And at a certain point it said, do you want to restore your phone? And I read that and I thought, oh, it's going to restore all my data to my phone. And I'm like, sure. And I hit restore and it completely wiped everything from my phone. I had all of these drawings and photos of the crew from these really formative times that were just gone in an instant. I completely broke down. I'd never felt like that before, like just to have years of my life just vanish. And I never got it back. The movie comes from that experience because I started to think about what would happen if these characters were restored to factory settings and all of their progress had, you know, got wiped. Default setting selected. Please stand by. The whole point of Steven Universe is that the characters are making progress, that they're having these long, interesting character arcs, that they're going from being gems that are programmed to behave a certain way to like really finding themselves. In order to break the show, we have to break that theme, and that's what the movie does. What we really wanted to do at the start of the movie was give you this sense that everything had concluded. You know, they started really believing that, essentially, that the show is over and that their stories are over, and that's really important for them because they feel like they've been through so much and they're really excited to have the story be done. Here we are in the future and it's bright. Nothing to fear, no one to fight. I really liked the thought of breaking down happily ever after and how it's not a very helpful idea. These characters are never going to be done working on themselves. There's still a lot more for them to learn. I'll be ready every day for as long as I can say. I love musicals and I love animated musicals, so I really, really wanted to do it. And Mr. Greg was a little bit of a test. Hey, shake a leg. Hey, shake a leg. It's Mr. Greg. It's Mr. Greg. It's like a lifelong dream to do a musical, so I was thinking, how can we do this? I want to do this, and we need time to do something like this, because we'd want to do it right. Both love me and I love both of you. It was like a mix of, of research. This was the part that we really shared, because we were both still working on our respective shows. Mm -hmm. And yeah. every night we would either watch, like, a musical or a TV movie. Yeah, we really try to break down, like, what makes those things tick? Right. This was a movie and it had to feel a little bit bigger and a little bit different, but I think the thing that makes Steven so special is how intimate and character focused it can be. So it was finding the balance between making this feel like the biggest Steven Universe adventure yet, but never losing sight of the fact that it's about Steven and the gems and just their struggles and the things that matter to them. So a lot of the creative team had to come back to work on the movie. I had already left for OKKO OK yeah, at that left. time. And Ben and Matt were leaving for Craig of the Creek, which mm -hmm. was actually the, one of the trickiest things. We had the chance, there was some sort of crossover where we were able to still work on like the outline, the basic story of the movie, which was so awesome to kind of you know do one last thing for the show, because we yeah. love the show so much. It was very hard for us to leave, even though we were so excited to have our own show. Steven meant a lot to us. And then we gathered up all the board artists and our two writers, Matt and Ben. And I think Ian was also there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all went to Topanga Canyon. And we spent a weekend just sort of hashing out what we thought the plot could be and what the character of Spinel was. Yeah, it was uh, mostly just an excuse just to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? I'm videotaping it. No, no, no. no. For posterity. <laughs> Yeah, we were there for three days. Three days. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the first time I told everybody the idea, which was a lot more fleshed out than a lot of my pitches are, because I'd been working on it on the side for for a year and change. Everyone should start reforming out of their gems, but then the twist is that they've all been restored to 
factory settings. So as soon as they come out, they're not the people that we know and love. That part of the story was always there, that aspect of Stephen trying to collect these pieces of his family again. And the main new element was Spinel. One of the things I was really excited about with Spinel was to create this character that felt that felt like she was frozen in time. And you could tell that she's an old cartoon. She's basically like a birthday clown, and she can't stop being that person. Let me get a look at the menagerie. And then out of the ship would come our new character, which would be Spinel, um, uh, who is just like so twisted and contorted with anger and would launch into her villain song, which would also be like her tragic backstory song. That's right, I heard the story over and over again. <laughs> Gee, it's swell to finally meet her other friends. And what was fun about that writer's retreat was, I remember there was a point where we were just like, you know what, let's just sit down and think about it from song to song. I really want to write Uzo a song. Uh, I think Bismuth should have well, she should be really distressed. I think she would care a lot. She'd really hate to see everybody acting like this. And then we tried to fill in the gaps of what needed to come between each song to get us to the next song. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of gave us like a skeleton. And then we could write on top of that. So we got Young Garnet, Amethyst is back, Pearl is back. Spinel, I think, is becoming like, is unraveling. From there, we sat down and just sort of like on our nights and weekends, we're writing out this this whole new outline. Mm -hmm. We would just get together in the office and talk about notes that we had gotten on it and how can we incorporate those. Yeah, and taking the initial structure and then trying to be like, okay, like what, how are we making this big and exciting? How big is the bad guy? Like, how does this become like the biggest threat to Steven? This was a character that he was going to have to fight and he, does talk to her and sing to her and, and challenge her, mm -hmm. but he can't really help her. She can only really help yeah. herself. You can't change the way I feel. <laughs> That's right. Only you can. There was going to be this looming threat of her becoming um, her villain self again, which in, in early versions, she actually switches back and forth a mm -hmm. lot more, and Stephen yeah. had to... Um, actually continue to reset her so that she wouldn't right. be hurting people. The idea of a looming threat also is something that is very intrinsic to Steven Universe. It's something we've, we started the show with, with laser light cannon. And then we would have, oh, the threat of more gems coming back, or like, oh, there's a thing coming from space, and you know, we all have to get ready. And so we had that, but we needed to make it even bigger. I feel like the injector kind of ended up taking a really, really big part of the movie because the the thought was that Stephen's friends losing their memories wasn't quite enough to propel a whole long form movie. So a lot of our work was making the injector part of the thing that we really wanted, which was the musical and the family and friendship aspect of it. Writing these stories is just like a bunch of like, it's your problem solving and putting together a puzzle. It was like this race against the clock because I had to start writing the music as soon as possible, mm -hmm. but I couldn't write the music until the story was approved. After Change Your Mind, we got a small break in which Rebecca did not get a break. And she wrote, <laughs> what, 15 or 16 songs in a month. My goal at the time was to basically put an album together before we started boarding, an album of demos. It's like impossible to do this without having the music first because people need something to board to. Um, so we really needed to get it ready. Please, hurry. Right. Move out. <laughs> so I flew out to Chicago to work with Chance, and I pitched him what I had made with Estelle. I had a ton of lyrics, which were all really in flux, and he immediately felt like pushing it more positive. I mean, we both had a lot of thoughts about what we wanted to say to kids and how we wanted to encourage them to embrace the truth. And he kind of painted this picture of like a kid with a sort of like hiding their report card from their mom or, or just like this feeling of like being afraid of whatever's kind of over this hill and not knowing what it is and, and not moving towards it because of that fear and, and how he wanted our song to kind of dispel that. It's the truth. He described it like a kid like swinging their arms. Like the, the truths were kind of sultry and he wanted the truths to be like, 
like like you're swinging your arms walking to school like he wanted to keep it childish and it was so specific and when i write music i'm sort of like well these are the chords and this is the melody and that's what it is and it'll be some version of that when it's done like i i never thought of how much character thinking about something like just thinking about the image of a, of a child swinging their arms could bring to a piece of music and could change about the way that you're singing it and the idea that every word could matter and every thought you're having about it needs to affect the, the way that it's sung, the timing, the tone. I feel like I learned all of that from being in Chicago for two days. <laughs> We'd better get cracking. So I had folders, um, I believe 12 folders with the names of each song, they were all empty. So now one of them had something in it and I like marked it in green or whatever. And I'm just looking at the other 11 that I have to get done. I was like, I've got to be alone and record some of what I've put together and figure it out and tie it down. And that's when I came here. I was also working on Drift Away, which I had been noodling on. Do you think you're, you're going to be able to finish? I'm not sure. It's a lot of songs to write. Isn't it Love was the least figured out? The next day, I walked around the beach alone, just trying to figure it out. And I brought that to Estelle, and it changed a little bit from there. And then Jeff came out. I remember you came in the morning. I had already been here for a day. Yeah, I brought my guitar. We just sat on those chairs outside the, the air stream. How were you feeling when we were starting? It was good. It was exciting. It was fun to be like in a new place and just to try to absorb all the like cool energy from <laughs> this this beautiful view and like just being somewhere new. It's like, it's, it's, it's a good way to get creative. So the big thing we were working on when we were here was definitely here we are in the future. One, two, three, four. Here we are in the future. Here we are in the future and it's bright. I was still trying to figure out the once upon a time. Once upon a time I thought I'd always be in my mother's shadow. I knew broad strokes that, that that was going to be the format of the song, that it was going to be here we are in the future and then there were going to be backstories for each character that would reintroduce who they are. I knew I wanted it to feel dramatic, that it would be really happy and then it would be like this, this dramatic flurries of backstories and then it would pop back into being bright and happy when they finish their arcs. And I think I, I had explained it wrong and he ended up playing it twice as fast as I was thinking and then that's what it actually is and now that's like the spine of all of the Once Upon a Time parts. That was a real like just kind of spontaneous creative decision to make. Yeah it was it was yeah. an actual accident but it really uh, it really came out good and that's my favorite part of it because it feels so um, nervous and there's all that tension built into the like descending chromatic steps of the harmony. <laughs> I wrote this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but then working with Jeff is different because we have worked together for a while. Um, so I just hope that everything will sound like Jeff because <laughs> Jeff's music is amazing. I want to like watch what your hands are doing now that I'm trying to learn. I have a lot of chord ideas. I can just, I try them out, see what Rebecca likes, and then we like stitch them all together with the B minor. And then E minor, and then. Certain songs in the musical are sort of stylized and are very different because of who I'm collaborating with. I think it's great. But other songs have to be like the stapliest Steven Universe songs. I'm gonna be right by your side no matter what. There has to be elements of, um, Garnet and Amethyst and Pearl and Steven and, and how you've gotten to know them through music woven throughout. So that's why working with Jeff and Ivy and Sarashu was really important because we had to keep it sort of grounded in our signature sound. And then when something like Other Friends comes around, it's just like, we haven't had, like, we've never had a villain song before because it's never really been a part of our show before. The alienness of it is, is crucial. We did try to get in some different styles. Spinell's big like appearance song, like 
That's in the style of electro swing, which is very new for the show. Like it has this jazzy style, which is meant to reflect Spinell's design, where because she's inspired by uh, old rubber hose cartoons from the early 20th century. What did you do without me? What did you do? My heart was racing every day. That's one thing I really noticed. Is that even after I was finished. My heart was still racing for another two or three weeks, which is when I really noticed how, how nervous I'd been. It's ironic because so much of the feeling of Steven Universe is like being on the beach and being with your family and taking the time to appreciate simple aspects of being alive. And I don't really get to do that. I haven't really gotten to do that. I didn't relax at all. I worked really, really hard and I was very, very scared. Um, but I got a bunch of it down. Writing 14 songs in six weeks is not usually part of my job. And it that, was insane. Yeah, I was yeah. really, um, <laughs> I was like a, a different person. Found the, the one I mm -hmm. heard in the dream was in it found was an addition mm -hmm. because I was trying to write a counterpoint um, right. to the end, and somewhere around there, I was sleeping and I had a dream where I was watching footage of a finished song, <laughs> and then I woke up and I recorded it. Yeah. But I, but it was already done when it was I was already finished, and it yeah. had like a really specific arrangement, which I've still been explaining to Ivy and Sarashu, like with like oboes in it, <laughs> like it was done, I was watching it. Someday, somewhere, somehow, you're gonna feel found. Today, right here, right now, I already feel found. In theory, we were talking about the movie being just the best version of the show, but in reality, we are doing something that's so much more cinematic. Once upon a time, I thought I'd always be in my mother's shadow. Here We Are in the Future was huge, and the song has to do so many things. It has to <laughs> set up the new paradigm on Earth, where each of the characters are, um, where Steven is, um, and then new locations, new characters. That song on its own is an 11 minute episode. <laughs> yeah. uh, There's a lot of flashbacks and that was really fun to get to work on because it's kind of in a different style than we normally do. It doesn't have any lines, so I was able to design the backgrounds just based on the board using just color. So that was really fun. That one song start to end, Rebecca did parts, I did mm. parts, Kat did parts, Hillary did parts. Within a scene, you can have like five people's drawings in it. Yeah, it took a village <laughs> to really do that whole section. It's a, definitely a team effort. That's what makes it good. <laughs> What's been good about the movie is that Rebecca has been part of the breakdowns. The breakdown is the first thing that we do. We take a look at the board with the storyboard directors and we discuss the creative direction of the show. From the very beginning, I've had a sense of where she wants to go, and that's been really good. The other thing is that I meet with Rebecca twice a week. So we go over design, background design, background color, and character color. So I get check-ins regularly with how she's feeling about things. Yeah, it looks awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm Patrick Bryson, and I'm a lead background painter on the show. We figure out what time of day each scene is going to be. This is kind of what we were setting up. Um, we, Patrick and I collaborated on this color That's rough right. just to sort of get a sense of how things were progressing. And we figure out uh, all the props and effects that need to be called out. I spend more time on this plate than I should with myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always a little thing. It is. I am the prop designer. We do a lot of collaboration with um, the storyboarders and the background designers. We're all trying to stay really integrated with each other. Careful with that. It's a rejuvenator. We look at what's happening with the prop. So it might be like a mug or something. And I see whether it's been like lifted. So you see the bottom. I see what parts need to be designed so that our animators can actually know what to do with all of it. I look at what the character looks like and I use that to come up with a sort of visual language for her items. Spinel, for example, the rejuvenator 
has these hidden heart shapes in it. It looks like a scythe, but then if you kind of look at how it connects to the, the central gem, there's like a little bit of like a roundness there that's like kind of reminiscent of a heart. I'm Ashley Fisher and I'm a color designer. I receive black and white designs from character designers and the prop designers. And then I choose the colors that will fit appropriately in the Steven Universe world. And I use the painted backgrounds that all these talented painters have painted. And I make sure that everything fits together. By your side, be right by your side. Be right by your side. I'm Becky Drystadt. I design all the major new characters. I work very closely with Rebecca Sugar on like any of the major designs because she usually has a very specific idea of what she would like for them. How's it going, everybody? The way that people were coming at Steven as a, as a teenager, I think we all feel a, a lot older having <laughs> spent so long working on this show. Getting to age him up felt really good. His behavior became so mature that getting to just, it just felt right. This is Steven's new design. He's two years older. <laughs> Rebecca had already started on a turn for Steven, age 16. And there were like a couple other sketches that they had done of him. We already knew he was going to have like a new jacket. We're going to see a little bit of his neck, <laughs> which was a little bit tricky to do because I wasn't used to it. <laughs> trying to figure out this neck. The neck, very exciting. Uh, when Rebecca told me about that before I even saw it, I was like, um, neck acquired. <laughs> As part of Steven's new character design for when he got older, the, the jackets that he's always wearing, that's that's because I wear jackets all the time. She's like, oh, Zach does that, like that would fit. He's got a really great jacket collection, so I wanted to represent that. <laughs> Spinel was like, super fun, but also very tricky because there had never been a character this cartoony in Steven Universe before. So it, it was like a bit of a balancing act figuring out a design that looks like the show style still, but she's very much like a 1920s cartoon. It is really fun how there's like the gem characters and then there are human characters. It's not like a very modular style, so there's a lot of freedom. Like, all, all the characters have different body types, and they all have, like, a similar style, but look different enough where it's it's really fun to draw the characters. Independent together, independent together, you and I. Unlike just sort of a regular boarding process, um, you know, the, the music and the timing was very important for this. Right from the beginning, um, we were, I was working straight from the musical track, uh, making sure that all the drawings that I was doing were fitting, you know, sort of the tone of the song and the rhythm of the, uh, of the song as well. In Who We Are a sequence. Hasn't it always been hard to be us? Steven is feeling down about everyone basically having their memories wiped. So he kind of goes to Bismuth for some information or reassurance. Even if it takes a thousand years to get them back, we will. And the song that Bismuth sings is kind of, you know, to remind him we've always had to struggle and persevere. So who we are is, you know, we're the crystal gems and we never give up on our friends. And how does the song go? We'll find a way to save the day. That's who we are. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> I was really moved by a true kind of love, and I was kind of hoping that I would get it. <laughs> there was a lot to keep track of because every character sort of shows up. You know, I really wanted to balance the amount of destruction with scenes of characters helping each other and being kind to each other because that was sort of what struck me about the song because it's so much about pain, but also pushing through it and loving through it and living through it. I had put a lot of heart into it. <laughs> we have guest animation done by Hori Takafumi. I think that is really special. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible animation. He is fantastic at his job, and he loves the show, so he really, you know, you can see his heart and love put into those drawings, which is really fun. He did a lot of the Spinel sequences specifically. He animated for Other Friends, Off of Boards by Mickey Brewster, which were already just unbelievably amazing. Everyone that we talked to specifically called out your storyboard. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed. Oh, stop. It's just about Spinel sort of like villaining it up. 
she's such a stretchy character and she's, she can move wherever she wants. I really wanted her to show off how powerful and fun and kinetic she was. The combination of like Mickey's boards and Takafumi Hori's animation, when we got his keys back, it's just like, this is, you know, it's just unfair to every other animated thing. <laughs> It's just so cool. He did animation way in advance because that's what worked with his schedule. And so as a result, for those pitches, we had animation in it. So it looked like really cool polished yeah, piece. Yeah, he got to take Mickey Brewster's boards and then just add his own sort of flourish and finesse to them. And it made this like rock star of a sequence that <laughs> yeah. we were able to show at the first pitch. I always wanted board stuff. That's so exciting that people just yell and they you know, they feel it, you know? Sometimes I'll get distracted watching the animation because it's so good. My job basically is to take the storyboards and then draw backgrounds based on those for the characters to move across and interact with. A special world built just for Pink and I. I always try to like make sure that whatever I draw doesn't get in the way of the characters. Rebecca had a really good way of putting it where she was saying to have things in the background that are unimportant but meaningful. Yeah. It's never gonna be like the main focus, but at the same time, you know, whenever, if you linger on it or maybe you come back and watch it a second time and there'll be like little extra layers of meaning that you can get. I had a lot of fun doing the interior of Steven's new house. Most of it was designed by Steven Sugar already. And my job was just to make it this livable space that would work out for the movie. They wanted a lot of old knickknacks from across the last couple of seasons, so in little spots, there are just props and objects that appeared earlier in the show. I have Rose's broken sword. I can't believe they let me get away with that. Um, but yeah, that's the new space. We did it. I was in charge of Drift Away, and um, I just did the first pass of it. That section. Uh, <laughs> Kat boarded it, and it's excellent, and it makes me cry every time I think about it. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that cool? And isn't that cruel? And aren't I a fool? We do everything in Storyboard Pro, which is a program on the computer, and we draw on Cintiqs. Um, but I am old school, so I did everything on paper. So I have some, like, reflected pieces. Are you, are you showing big Steven? I'm <laughs> um, And I was just sort of, like, brainstorming different images. We were pulling references from a few things. Um, I think the aspect of going back into memories was a big thing, and Spinell Having two sides of her personality is huge. Thousands of years go by. Right now, I'm working on uh, Spinell's garden. There's a shot where we see it in the past, and it's pristine and beautiful. And then my job is to bring it like 6,000 years in the future, and a lot of it is just thinking about how plants warp stones in different ways. Like, you know, when you walk down a sidewalk and then you trip because a tree root pushed up the sidewalk under your feet, like that. Someday, Found is right after Drift Away, so it's a hard act to follow. It's a really complicated scene because there's a lot of things going on. Steven genuinely wants to help Spinell, but he's also got this ticking clock of the Earth is gonna die if I don't get you to come back and stop the injector. So it's like genuine feeling, but a real sense of urgency of desperation, like I need to get this done. Before, most of my boarding was on regular show, so drawing stuff with like a lot of subtle emotion was really cool. I was very excited to do that. What I love about this movie is that we're really trying to push the boundaries of what Steven Universe can do. We're trying to um, go in a really abstract place and a really interesting place with design. And from a creative point of view, uh, I, I'm really connected with that. I'm really excited about that. I think with the movie, there's there's an expectation that the animation will be um, sort of uh, just sort of a step up from what people are used to seeing in the TV show. The movie has some shading. We wanted there to be more shading like close up versus when it's like a mid shot or further away. I'm very happy with the results. I think it's going to make the movie look a lot cooler. <laughs> the boards were incredible. Uh, the songs were incredible. Uh, all the work that had been done on solidifying the characters, explaining their arcs. So much work went into that, and when you pitched it all together, it was, yeah, it was really magical. This is super cheesy, and I know it, but uh, even before I was on the show, like, these people were my heroes, and, like, now 
I, I can just focus on like trying to learn as much as I can from every one of the other board artists and the directors. I can go down like a list of like everyone <laughs> that just like did really amazing stuff. You know, like when I, when I saw Paul's Independent Together, when I saw that for the first time um, in in the pitch room, I was just like, <laughs> this is amazing. This is like everything I want to be able to do. There is so much more collaboration on this show than there is on any other show I've ever worked on. You think having a lot of cooks in the kitchen is gonna make a terrible soup, but because we have Rebecca at the helm, it's sort of her vision that kind of guides all of these ideas in one direction, and it works. Everybody's opinion and ideas are included and welcomed. What I love about working with a team is that we all have really different perspectives on the stories that we tell. I get so inspired by where other people are coming from with it. Everyone is so talented. I'm so excited to see you. Yeah. <laughs> it's all done. Whenever I see color now, I'm just like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> These characters are in color now? Yeah. That's great. Good job. Keep it up. The movie will come back in chunks. We have three acts. And so act one will come back. And obviously some of the music's already done, but then anything that's not um, a song that's already been created for the musical will be done by our composers. That's the main thing that's happening. Uh, on the side right now, Rebecca actually just uh, went up and met with our composers, uh, Ivy and Sarashu. So where are you going? I'm gonna see Stephen and Ivy. Normally when we write music for Stephen Universe, we come at the very end after Everything's done, we're at the end of the production chain. And then I think for the movie, we really kind of switched it up and it really became like, oh, we write the songs first um, and we kind of write the thing around the songs now. Yeah. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense for a musical anyway. We were able to arrange a lot of it um, and even compose some of it, uh, which usually we didn't get to do because like we were not usually present at the writing of an episode. The first plan for Isn't It Love was to play Stronger Than You Backwards. Oh, yeah. The concept for Isn't It Love was going to be that Garnet came into existence backwards and now yeah. is partially remembering who she is yeah, in, the, in this Sapphire different order. Yeah, was the one to initiate this time. Yeah. Uh, unlike previous time when it was uh, Ruby, Right, it's flip. It's flip. Yeah. yeah. I had thought that we had completely abandoned this concept, but now that I hear it again, I think it's, it's still, still there. in there. It's still kind yeah. of there. Yeah. Do doesn't this have a name? Da 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 da. So, yeah, it's like. Yeah. Um, da 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 da. Stronger than you backwards. Yeah. yeah. Da -da -da -da. Doesn't this have a name? La -da 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 -da. I think one of the challenges for me and Ivy was also to to unify the idea of every song being kind of different and um, representing the whole spectrum of what Steven Universe can be, but also everything sounding like Steven Universe. In the light of the day, in the dark of the night. We decided really early on on a sound palette, and we decided that every character is represented by a different instrument. So we have Steven, who has a pretty wide variety of sounds, but uh, he has chip tune when he's just like being fun loving. He has strings and vi violins when he um, is thinking about his mom or is relating to his mom. And then Pearl has piano as her main instrument. Um, and Amethyst has drums and Garnet has bass. And these, those three kind of represent a basic jazz ensemble. That's also a thematic thing where um, gems tend to be um, not just straight earth instruments. They tend to be synthetic or affected in some way. Um, and Pearl is kind of the exception, I think, because she's been on earth the longest of all of them. My reasoning for that is that um, so much of Pearl's personality was influenced by Rose. Yeah. And Rose loved the earth. And actually that kind of ties back into the movie uh, because Pearl gets reset and she's sort of maybe the most extreme reset. How do you do my um Greg universe? Thank so she has no piano when she uh, reappears. She actually only has synthetic instruments. So like we really wanted to kind of imply that all that 
sort of humanity is all because of her experiences. And isn't it, isn't it? Garnet's base is still there, but it's different and she's more naive. And I think that Amethyst is a little more there already. The drums are already kind of there. They're a little more inherent to what, who she is. Spinel kind of has the appearance of a really old cartoon character. Yeah. And in her musical style and instrumentation, we also wanted to get a little bit of that old timey sound. Did you think all this time that I wouldn't find out about you? And yeah. strings were a good approach because they both allowed us to express that old timiness while also tying her to Pink Diamond and Rose and Steven. It's like a, a sampled string um, from a Mellotron, but it's been heavily affected um, and like really like almost sounds like broke, basically broken. And she is kind of like broken by her experiences. I don't want to play anymore. We started working on this myth song in our old apartment. Um, yeah. Rebecca came up to visit us. And it's one of the first songs that we worked on together as the three of us mm -hmm. for the movie. I, think I wanted to go somewhere like, okay, that's... like big. Yeah. She's such a great character and we decided to use a reverse electric guitar because we um, wanted to kind of make a play on the word metal since she um, has a forge and she makes mm -hmm. weapons. But Bismuth's character has a um, warmth to it. It's softer around the edges, yeah. and that's why we went with that sound. Yeah. And it's also um, unique, I think. Mm -hmm. It gives her something special. I think that our goal in making music for Steven Universe is that if you wanted to dig, you could keep digging for a really long time and still find things that mean something. Rebecca is super amazing to work with. She gives us a lot of freedom and she really respects our opinions and perspectives. And something that I really, really like about working with her is that everything is so meaningful. The music is so, it's so important to the show. It gives you a level of understanding that is so much bigger than it would be without it. It's just mm. massively, massively important. And I'm just talking about the score. Rebecca never makes you feel like you're thinking too hard about something. Mm. You can put your all into it and yeah. she accepts that. She's always like encouraged uh, experimentation and it's always been really, really fun to work. We really are honored that she trusts us with her musical ideas and we hope that we encourage her oh, yeah. Yeah. to keep exploring her musical side. Here we are in the future. I write songs specifically for my cast members and I like to talk to everybody. I like to ask them what kind of music that they like so that I'm writing things that they're excited to sing. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> Are you coming in? What is she? <laughs> I was like, our hands were just. This will be good because we'll get we'll get two of the two okay. of the harmonies together. So. Okay. okay, let's go to the future. I really have to try, especially when I'm writing something for Dee Dee, to <laughs> hit notes that I'm not capable of hitting, uh, that I know that she'll be able to do. Here we are in the future. Oh, that's great. Every time I walk in and see these lovely faces, and I'm not Josh, and they are lovely faces to look at. It's always so fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a big family reunion. It's been great um, being in the booth with everyone, and it's just, it's just so funny. We all get it so excited every time we see each other, even when it's back-to-back -back weeks, you know? We're just, ah, it's a reunion every time. So it's nice. The thing I like the most about Garnet and her character is that it's quite close to my actual personality in that she's sarcastic and a little bit flat sometimes. <laughs> the way she speaks, her mannerisms, um, her protective energy is, is, is quite me. I'm always talking with Estelle whenever I'm 
writing a song for Estelle, we've worked on it beforehand. And for the movie, we met up and sat down and, and really hashed it out. We worked on a few songs um, for, the, um, for the film. Steven Universe is her baby. So I always feel super honored and quite grateful when, you know, um, that she thinks, you know, that I have a valid say in this side. We do vastly different styles of music. <laughs> Any second now, I was about to start rapping. <laughs> but it's good songwriting, it's good songwriting. That's how it translates. One that sticks out to me is the song that Rebecca and Estelle wrote, Isn't It Love? Isn't it love? Ah. Just kind of, it makes me want to like get in a car and be cheesy and put my hands out and like feel the wind and feel good about life and love and maybe get a dog. I don't know. It makes me want to do a lot of great things. <laughs> Show me solvable problem. Getting to sing on Garnet's number was really cool. Partially because, you know, Chance the Rapper was behind it and I'm a huge, huge hip hop guy. And uh, I wasn't originally supposed to be on that track. Um, the specific section that Steven sings when he's climbing, Estelle was like, no, I think this fits better with Steven. I think, I think he should, he should have this bit. So I got that little part and it was, it was really, uh, it made me feel very good. Wow, little homeworld's growing fast. So are you. Look at me, I'm a young adult. <laughs> it's funny because people have been asking about this for a long time whenever I, I meet fans. Like, is Steven gonna get older? Because they know that my voice changed when I was younger on the show and we're wondering if that was the next logical progression. I can make a promise. I can make a plan. Change was like homecoming for the new voice, the, the age, the older Steven really coming into his own um, as a character and also for me vocally. Um, that's the first song that I sang, um, you know, in my own register that I felt like I had like 100% of my power. And it, it was really, uh, it was really fun. I did a little bit of melody improvisation that we don't normally do on that one because there was some room to, to freestyle that. You can make an effort, starting with tonight. There was a meeting we had at one point. <laughs> this was at the studio where we brought uh, a bunch of the cast in and played them what we had so far. And then we tried to figure out if it was a good key for them, which was really tricky for me because the best range for Zach is like the worst range for me. So there's a lot of, especially in change, you can really hear it because I was going really low. But then by the end, you kept all my high stuff and he did it and it's like amazing. So yeah, he's got a good range. Yeah, he has a huge amount of range. <laughs> I've always felt like Steve and I have had a, lot, a large amount of parallels between the two of us, and that's why it was such an interesting character study for me, starting at 14, now I'm 21, um, going through these arcs of life and like going through all the, the things we went through together, taking on an unusual amount of responsibility for someone our age. All those struggles, I learned from them and I grew. Just read tap dance, Michaela. Yeah. <laughs> Shelby just left, unfortunately. I'm only good at the fake tap dancing that Shelby taught me. Do you remember singing and dancing with me? Shelby, who's uh, the voice actress of Peridot, she's actually a, a tap dancer, and so she did some choreography for us. I just got out of the booth just now for uh, my duet with Michaela for Steven and Amethyst, and it was fun to do on its own, but doing it together and like having the call and repeat, that really, I think took it to another level. And that can be a little jaunty, like um, uh, hanging around. Just remember this song. Like, Just remember this song. Yeah. Just remember this song. How's it go? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be right, right by, by your side, side no matter what. 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 Oh, I'm gonna be. Oh, I'm gonna be. Right by your side. Right by your side. I'm gonna be, be right, right by, by your side no matter what. what. Did you say, oh, I'm gonna be? I did, I did it back. I did it back for you. Zach and I are buddies. Uh, I definitely find that he's the little brother that I always wish I had. Hey. He's a really special kid, just like Steven, and I'm very sensitive also like Steven, so I have a big place in my heart for both of them. Amethyst, it worked! You're back! It made sense to me that Amethyst was the first gem that Steven um, was able to kind of recover, and then they worked together, and, you know, they were the first two to fuse together. Who are you supposed to be? 
smoky courts. Yeah, it seemed like a really natural place for, for Steven to begin, to have a, a good friend as an ally in trying to recover the rest of the gems. When we cast Sarah Stiles as Spinell, part of her audition was Drift Away. That was my favorite for a long time because it was the first song we heard uh, with the character's voice mm -hmm. on it. Um, and that, that was like, it was like immediately, we were like, there we go, yeah, that's, that's her. Um, we got her. <laughs> One of the things that I auditioned with was Drift Away. I remember it so clearly. I had had kind of a weird day. Sarah Stiles had had kind of a weird day and got an email from my agent saying, you know, there's this project. Can you record it? It's due tomorrow. Can you record it on your phone and send it to me? I remember sitting on my bed and listening to Drift Away and having such um, a visceral reaction to hearing the song. And then I read the sides and I read the breakdown and I thought, oh, wow, well, I'm gonna get this because I felt so strongly that I needed to tell this story and and uh, represent this girl. Hearing uh, Sarah's audition was, I mean, it was, it really felt like the character. She can do like a perfect, like, uh, her own version of like that kind of old cartoony like style of singing. Right. It all came together. It felt really good. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. I actually was not super familiar with Steven Universe. I hadn't ever seen any of it, but of course I knew about it. It's such a part of pop culture. And to be honest, I was not really aware of the scope of it when I booked it. Because when you get the audition, you're only given a little bit of material, so you don't really know what the whole thing is gonna be. And then when I got there and Rebecca, I met Rebecca immediately, and I got the first act, I believe, of the movie. And I was flipping through it, and I remember talking to my boyfriend going, I, I'm kind of in a lot of this. I think I'm a big part of this movie. <laughs> Your new best friend. Your new best friend. Your new best friend. Spinell is definitely the most intense character I've ever had to play. I've played lots of characters with wide range of emotions, but she's off the charts, wide range of emotions. No! <gasps> oh, okay. Let's go together? Yay! <laughs> I love that the Spinell has such opportunity to laugh every kind of way you can laugh. I mean, it's like wild and manic at times and then like adorable and cutesy. And I love to laugh. So being able to like discover all these different levels of laughter, that was so awesome. Oh, 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 wow. I got the honor to record Found with Zach. What a lovely human he is and so talented. And to be able to be in the room with him and, and working off of each other, that's always, that rarely happens in animation. And so it was, a, it was a gift to do that. Someday, somewhere, somehow, you'll love again. So to be able to do that and sing that song together and work off of each other live, uh, I think made it just even that more special. I love uh, Spinell's song, Other Friends. And I'm really, really excited to see that whole sequence done. Um, it's one of, it's one of, uh, it's one of my favorite songs that you've ever written. It's so, it's so good and so fun. That's right, I heard the story over and over again. Gee, it's swell to finally meet her other friends. It's just been A1 since day one with Rebecca. Me and her sat down and had real life depthful conversations about the business and just how to keep your energy straight. And I've learned so much from watching her in the quiet moments. I feel so privileged to be directed by Rebecca. Is that too much of a stretch? No, I think it's good. It's supposed to be kind of whiny and weird. Okay, cool. Let's Not do it. Not to say that you sound whiny and weird. Oh no, I'm fully aware. <laughs> <laughs> it really feels like she more than anyone else understands these characters. She's also very funny. I don't know if she considers herself to be a funny person, but Rebecca's really funny. <laughs> this one's called Disobedient. When I met with Mike, 
I was like panicking because I only had a month and a half to do all this stuff, right? And uh, to write like 16 songs. Whoa. So and I was crazy. like, can you help me, please? And he was like, well, I did this album, but I'm not going to use I, any of it. And he like played me like eight instrumental tracks. So he's like, you want one? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So we, this is like, mod it's modified. So I, I did the chorus with him. But um, this is, I really like this one because it's... It's a jam. It's very pure. Oh, yeah. oh, to me. Was that closer, Mom? That was good, yeah. <laughs> Mom! Okay, great, great. Okay, cool. Can we try that again? Rebecca is authentically herself and very generous and so passionate about this project. And it's inspiring because when someone is that hands-on and and has that much care to detail and m respect for a project, it makes you want to have that same be on her level. Yeah, cool. I think on the at the top, maybe you could go back into that kind of paranoid place a little bit. We need her to be there and 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 explain um, everything in its infancy when it's it's still in storyboards and because it, it hasn't all come together yet. And when it when it finishes, it's brilliant. Every bit of uh, minor character development detail and foreshadowing and um, uh, reference to past episodes has to be picked up on, um, even in the smallest bits of dialogue. She's a generational talent, and being able to work with her on a weekly basis for the formative years of my youth and my career has been very important for me. Everything that she's written about Steven Universe from the very, very beginning, it seems as though she's had these backstories in her brain uh, for years and years and years. Um, and that everything is so detailed. And when the fans watch the shows, uh, I, I, they're so smart. The audience is so smart finding all of these little Easter eggs that she's planted. It is so rewarding because I feel connected with millions of strangers and cartoons are just my way of expressing myself. I'm, I really feel like I'm expressing myself for, for better or for worse on my good days or my bad days or just however I'm feeling and I really put it into the show and I don't really know how to stop. And the movie is like that times 20. And so I'm grateful to the team and the fact that they've done that with me, expressed themselves through the show, been able to use it in that way, been able to take that risk with me. I was a fan of the show for a really long time, but I'm also a pretty big nerd when it comes to animation. And so actually seeing like the inside like process of how things go down and how the stories are developed was really exciting. I loved the show back when I was in college and it kind of helped me decide what I wanted to do. It's also a dream come true for me because I get to work on one of my favorite shows. I never thought that we would be able to make a show like this, so it kind of makes me really hopeful for the future. And something I'm really excited to see is kids that were influenced by Steven to like see the possibilities and then, you know, they come up and start making their own stories and comics and they work in animation. It's gonna be really uh, fun to see what they do. There's like pieces of media that you see and it really inspires you to want to do something. And I feel like Steven Universe is is that, and the movie is going to be that for a lot of people. I was on Steven Universe from the, the first episode up until the movie. So the movie was the last Steven Universe project I worked on. So it felt very like, uh, like, like climactic, just both in terms of the story and in terms of my own life. When you're with a project right from the very beginning and you see it just develop out of nothing, it's it's a really um, just satisfying and rewarding experience. I really like the positive message that it has, and it's very progressive. Obviously, I'm a fan. Um, I think the show has had some really healing uh, properties for, for a lot of people, but also for me. Working on Steven Universe throughout the years has really helped me to learn to accept myself the way that I am and to love myself, and I am so happy to be a part of this show and also that something like this exists for yeah. people. I hope that Steven Universe um, represents sort of a greater acceptance of differences. Working on Steven Universe in general was just 
a life-changing experience. We got to work on a show that touched so many people's lives, and it's incredible. It really showed me the power of, you know, what we do in, in working in TV, can, what that power is, and how to responsibly use it. And I mean, it, it's forever changed how I'm gonna approach the things that I'm gonna make. It's just so part of us. Yeah. I mean, I love it. I can't imagine I'll have to one day work on something else, but I can't imagine it. It means the world to me, uh, just having this opportunity to be uh, so involved in the process of creating this world and this story and these characters. Um, you don't get many chances like that. When you're working on something that you believe in and that you love, it makes all the hard work worth it. The other thing that I love in general about working on Steven Universe is when you tell people you work on Steven Universe, their eyes light up, you know, they're excited that that you are part of the show and you feel that energy when you're working on it. I feel like I'm always crying at Comic-Con when people have questions and they're like, let me tell you what this means to me. You're like, that's so beautiful, <laughs> please stop. Watching as the characters develop and as the characters become more and me getting to play and have an opinion in it and then looking at the reaction, the world's reaction to it, I just feel super blessed. We've been able to meet some fans and being able to hear how the show has touched their lives in a positive way as, um, is in turn touching my life as well. And I love that the show is is inclusive and so diverse. And I just want Steven Universe to go on forever and ever. <laughs> I think we've grown so much as individuals and um, especially the cast together. And that sort of family approach is, is what's made the show so special. That was a beautiful answer. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't mean any of it, but no. <laughs> yeah, I'm just goofing. Too soon, Amethyst. Literally a third of my life has been spent on Steven Universe, and to see it culminate like this um, with this family of people around me, it's, it's been very, very special. Working on the show was uh, very personal, and uh, getting to work on a show with the person who I love Almost done. That's good. What do you think, Lion? And see sort of our ways of coming up with ideas, interacting, and being together with all of the crew and creating an entire world that to us felt really real and fun. To do something like this has been, has been a lifelong dream and we really poured our hearts and souls into it. Happily ever after. Happily ever after. Happily 